Hi there, I'm Gideon Rose, editor of Foreign Affairs, and we're here with another edition of Foreign Affairs Focus, this time with General Stanley McChrystal, uh, the subject of an interview in our new March-April issue. Stan, you are going to be remembered for a number of things in your career. Uh, one of the most important is the change in special operations practices uh, that took place under your command in the middle years of the last decade, particularly from 2003 onward in Iraq and elsewhere. What did those changes consist of and why were they important? Well, I assumed I'd be remembered for my time as a military fellow at the council, but if it's got to be my time in special operations, that's okay. Really what I was a part of was a transformation of a significant part of the American military and actually the wider government as we focused on counterterrorism. As the commander of Joint Special Operations Command, I also commanded a task force that operated in the region, the Mideast, really across 27 countries, but primarily or most heavily in Iraq and Afghanistan. And what we found was we were, although we were a superb organization in 2003 when I took over, capable of the most precise and effective raids you can imagine, we weren't sufficient for the task we found to take on a very wide enemy network. Al-Qaeda in Iraq specifically in that country, but then across the region. So what we had to do is transform how we were organized, how we operated, how we led, how we thought, how we exchanged information, how we made decisions. And we had to do it all in the middle of a fight. And we had to really become a different force. I used to describe to people that when that part of the war started, when it started to get difficult in the fall of 2003, we were a bookstore. Two years later, we were the equivalent of Amazon.com. So, in practice, this meant you were able to carry out a lot of operations a lot more quickly? That, that would be sort of the output, but that wasn't the real strength of it. The reality was, to win a war nowadays, it's the person who knows, or the side which knows the most, which understands the quickest. And so the ability to both find information, pull it in, digest it, share it, and then empower people with this contextual understanding to make decisions and then follow up and take advantage of opportunities that come from those, that takes a completely different set of processes than we had in the old hierarchical way. So what it really meant to us is instead of in a tradition where the lower uh, levels of the organization would gather information, push it up, and you'd make decisions and then issue directives, we really turned that on its head and decisions were made at the lowest level but contextual understanding was brought together, synthesized across this uh, network, and then it was pumped to everybody. And so it allowed people not only to have what we call shared consciousness to understand, but also to have a sense of shared purpose. So they all felt like they were taking a bite out of the same elephant. So under your command, these uh, special operators did lots of raids. They, they got lots of bad guys. They did lots of killings. Uh, they uh, contributed materially to the war effort in Iraq. You eventually went on to become the commander of all the forces in Afghanistan where you did not sort of specifically just targeted killings and so forth, but also broader counterinsurgency and so forth. Right. I had grown up in the military really fascinated by counterinsurgency. My father was serving in Vietnam multiple times. I had been fascinated by the French in Indochina, Algeria, and other counterinsurgency or revolutionary wars, as a course I took at West Point was called. So that had always interested me. When I did the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan as the commander of the counterterrorism forces, I was necessarily focused on attacking a lot of uh, things to destroy the enemy network. But it really wasn't until about late 2006 and early 2007 that the efforts that we were doing, which at that point had gone up to 300 raids a month, 10 a night, just by my force, we weren't having strategic effect until it was married with an effective counterinsurgency strategy that really started to take root in Iraq in the fall of 2006. So what I came away with, my, my big learning, is you could go after, you could kill and capture as many as you wanted, and it was a necessary activity, but it was only part. It, by itself, it couldn't be decisive. 
and only when you had other organizations that were able to hold ground, create host nation forces, do the kinds of things that give local governance, local economic opportunity the chance to take hold. Unless you do those as well, everything you do in the direct action part is temporal. Okay. There are those who would say that, gee, I liked the Stan McChrystal of JSOC, and I'm not too keen on the Stan McChrystal of counterinsurgency and clear hole build in Afghanistan. So, you know what? We're moving out of Afghanistan. Uh, let's just keep the raids, the drones, the targeted killings, and have that be our middle ground in the war on terror between doing nothing and uh, heavy footprint boots on the ground and so forth. What do you say to that? I'm sure there are people that don't like either Stan McChrystal, but uh, what I would say is the problem with direct action raids is they do have an effect. You can kill or capture enemy leaders, you can set back their organization, but I found that those kinds of blows were, were never decisive. The problem is they give you the illusion of activity and the illusion of progress. They make you feel like you're doing something, and in reality, terrorism, terrorist groups, are a symptom of wider problems. And so if you just go after the symptoms over time, you'll feel good about it. You can even point to your constituency or you can report, point to anybody, look at all we're doing, but the problem can actually be getting worse because if you're just striking and you don't go after the uh, base problems, in many cases, the resentment that grows because there's always some kind of negative reaction to any action you take, even good ones, that you can find yourself lopsided. You find your, you've only learned how to whack, and we say it's the old whack-a-mole, and you can continue that indefinitely. There's a lot more. Go to the March April issue of Foreign Affairs or the website, foreignaffairs.com, to read all about it. Stan McChrystal, thank you very much. Gideon, thank you.